Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah Allahumma shahli sadri wa yisilli amri wa hlul uqtatim min lisani yafqahu qawli Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh It's beautiful mashallah tabarakallah to see you all here today Alhamdulillah most people when they see the title of such a lecture the first thing that comes to mind is pillars of faith I know all this, I know this. Alhamdulillah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase us all in knowledge. But it's great to see such a turnout, the beautiful faces of the brothers of this community here, benefiting inshallah, just as you will be benefiting from me, inshallah, I will be benefiting from you. Uh, one of the greatest things about being here is the fact that Jannah, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, will be made easy for us. It will be made easy for us, and that's a promise from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and that's a promise from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says in an authentic hadith, مَنْ سَلَكَ طَرِيقًا يَلْتَمِسُ فِيهِ عِلْمًا سَهَلَ اللَّهُ لَهُ طَرِيقًا إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ نَسَأَ اللَّهُ Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala أَنْ يَجْعَلَنَا مِنْ أَهْلِ الْجَنَّةِ the individual who sets out and leaves his house, just as you've, you've all left your house today, in the rain, right? The person who leaves his house and has the intention to go out and seek beneficial knowledge, then this person, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will make easy for him or for her the path to Jannah. And this is done in two ways. This is done in two ways. First and foremost is the action in itself. To seek knowledge is something sacred. It's something amazing. You're inheriting from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when you're coming and you're leaving the comfort of your home and you're driving here and you're spending your Friday night as many people are out partying the stampede season. You're here with Lillahi Alhamd, learning about the fundamentals, right? Back to the fundamentals of your religion. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us a proper understanding of this religion. The second reason that Jannah is made easy for you and I, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala, is because. After we learn, as Muslims, we implement our knowledge. After we learn, we implement our knowledge. We are not like those who know, uh, We're not like them. We're not like them. When we hear, we obey. Sami'na wa ta'na. That is the quality. And as the attribute. Those are the characteristics of a true mu'min. When we look at knowledge, knowledge is very easily broken down into two categories. Knowledge is broken down into two categories. The first of which is knowledge that is wajib. Known as fardu ayn. Knowledge that is incumbent upon each and every single one of us. SubhanAllah, I just want to stop here in my tracks. And we see the brother with one leg limping, coming to the masjid. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm sorry for putting you on blast, ya khi, But I love you for the sake of Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you. And for, I give you three steps instead of one. Huh? Inshallah ta'ala. It's beautiful. I love it. Alhamdulillah. So knowledge is broken down into two categories. The first of which is fardu ayn. Knowledge that every single Muslim, male or female, black or white, rich or poor, has to know. You have to know this. The second type of knowledge is what we call fardu kifaya. Knowledge that is almost a collective obligation to this community. Meaning that there's specific knowledge that specific individuals or a specific group of people in this community must have 
or else we will all be sinning. And this is why we look to our shuyukh, and we look to the students of knowledge, and we seek knowledge from them, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase them in knowledge and sincerity, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase us in knowledge and sincerity. When we talk about the hadith that we will be discussing today, what type of knowledge do you think we're talking about? Is it Fardu'ayn or Fardu Kifaya? Fardu'ayn, absolutely. Yani we could have chosen any topic in the world. We could have chosen any topic in the world. But we decided to choose the fundamental principles of Islam. This deen, what this religion is built upon. Because at the end of the day, that's what really matters. That's what will keep our house in Jannah upright, strong. The hadith I would like to share with you. But before that, another benefit to studying this hadith, they say that there are two, the two most important moments in your life. What are they? Some brothers will say the moment I accept Islam, some brothers will say the moment I get married. Huh? The moment, the moment he got divorced, huh? La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our relationships with our wives. Ameen. But the two most important moments of your life is the moment you were born. Obviously. And the moment you realize why you were created. Those are the two most important moments of your life. The moment you were brought into this world and you were created. And the moment you realize and understand your purpose of creation. And this hadith that we are studying today, bi ta'ala, it informs us, it teaches us, it clarifies for us the purpose of our creation. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Just to share the hadith with you, an Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu an qala qara rasulullahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam We've all heard this hadith. بُنِيَ الْإِسْلَامُ عَلَى خَمْسٍ شَهَادَةِ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا رَسُولُ اللَّهُ وَإِقَامَ الصَّلَاةِ وَإِتَاءِ الزَّكَاءِ وَالْحَجْ وَصَوْمِ رَمَضَانِ That's it. That's the purpose of your existence. Is to the best of your ability, uphold these pillars. بُنِيَ الْإِسْلَامُ Meaning Islam was established. It was built. Who built Islam? Who built Islam? Who created Islam? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the one who brought it into existence and decreed it for you and I, for it to be our religion. And for it to be the religion of all prophets and all messengers. Al-Islam. So we will discuss this hadith, but we will not discuss it in full. We will not discuss it in full. Initially, I said to myself, Let's just give an overview of the pillars of Islam. And then once I started doing the shahada, I said, this is going to take me over two hours just to talk about the shahada itself. And there's no way I can do shahada in salah, right? And hajj, right? And zakat, right? And, and salm. I can't do that all in once without giving it its true haqq. So I wanted to take two pillars. And these are the first two pillars of Islam, which are Al-Shahada wa salah bi ta'ala. We won't keep you here for too long. But let it be known that these two pillars are without a shadow of a doubt the most important pillars of our religion. These two pillars, without a shadow of a doubt, are the two most important pillars of our religion. So we begin with the Shahada. And as we know, the Shahada is the most important act of worship in our religion. Because without the shahada, we do not enter into the religion. Without the shahada, we do not become Muslims. We are not considered Muslims in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we are not considered Muslims in the sight of the jama'ah. Because we need to make this statement from our hearts and from our tongues. This is two conditions. That if somebody wants to enter into Islam, 
that they must have conviction in their heart, they must make this statement from within their heart, and they also must verbalize this statement. And this is seen, and we understand this, uh, Abu Talib, who was the uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was the protector of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was his muscle. He gave him support and protection from the rest of Quraysh. And he knew inside of his heart that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was indeed the Messenger of Allah. But the issue doesn't lie in him recognizing and knowing. There are many people in this world who know this. They know who Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is. They know that he is the true Prophet of Allah. But they do not verbalize this. Which does not allow them to enter into the religion. Therefore, if someone wishes to enter into this religion, if they're interested in entering into this religion, they've done their research, I'm interested in becoming a Muslim, then that statement must be made from the heart and it must be verbalized as well. Now when we look at the statement, the statement is, أَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدَ الرَّسُولُ اللَّهِ That is the statement. And this statement is broken into two components. The first component, it discusses Allah. The second component discusses Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we are going to study both components بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى Now, when we talk about the first component, which is أَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Now, I'm just going to ask you, if I ask you, I ask you, I know you, how are you? Alhamdulillah. If I ask you, brother, what is the shahada? What does ashhadu an la ilaha illallah mean? Good? Good? Anybody else? Very good? Muhammad? When you say it, you're submitting yourself to Allah. When you say it, you're submitting yourself to Allah. Very good. Submission. That's what Islam is, is submission. Muhammad? You submit and you recognize you don't worship anyone but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ahmed. Naam. Yes. Very good. That's it. Tfadbal, akhi. And the second thing is you will do it based on the sin of the Prophet you will not And the attibah, ahsant, barakallahu feek Very good, very good And we will go into detail But when we make that statement It's usually translated as there is no God but Allah And this is partially correct, partially incorrect We need to understand this This is the foundation of our deen, of our religion Without this we will never enter into Jannah we will never enter into Jannah without the proper understanding and implementation of this statement La ilaha illallah Ever Mustahil It will never happen This statement has two components in it There's negation and there's affirmation So what we're doing is we're negating This is the first thing we're doing we're negating that there is nothing in the world, nothing in the universe, nothing in the galaxy, no creation that is worthy of my submission, of my worship, of my love, except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's where the affirmation comes in. So nothing, you're, you're cleaning the table, and then you're putting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there, except for Allah, Al-Ilah, the one who is deserving to be worshipped. You know when somebody buys a house on the hill? You know, nowadays people, they're buying houses and what they're doing is they're flipping them. You know when somebody flips a house? They buy a house that's run down, right? And they say, you know what? I'm going to invest some money in this house and I'm going to make this house look beautiful. So what they do, they don't just enter into the house and start putting new carpet over the old carpet. They don't do that. They don't start painting without stripping the walls. 
right? What do they do? They gut the house. They gut the house until the house is completely empty. And then what they do is they begin to bring the nice furniture. They begin to start painting the new hardwood floor, mashallah. Similarly, we need to gut our hearts. We need to gut our hearts and remove every single thing from our heart, every desire, everything, our whims and our desires. We need to take that out and we need to bring Allah and we need to put Him in our heart. We need to negate anything that is worthy of worship and then affirm that the only one worthy of our ibadah is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's great reward to la ilaha illallah. There's absolutely great reward to la ilaha illallah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in our authentic hadith, man qala la ilaha illallah dakhala al-jannah. Simple. The individual who says la ilaha illallah dakhala al-jannah. You will enter into jannah. Another hadith, inna Allah qad harrama عَلَى النَّارِ مَنْ قَالَ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ يَبْتَغِي بِذَلِكَ وَجْهِ اللَّهِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the fire haram. It's haram for the person who says لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ seeking ikhlas. You know, seeking sincerity towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be amongst those who are sincere. So someone may come up to you and say, you know what, I'm good. I was at this lecture and the, the, the brother was telling me that if I say la ilaha illallah, I will enter into Jannah. Is this correct? Is this the proper understanding of these ahadith that we need to understand? Absolutely not. A scholar by the name of Wahb ibn Munabbih, he was approached by an individual and he was asked, he was asked, is not la ilaha illallah the key to Jannah. Meaning if I say La ilaha illallah, will I not be able to enter the doors of Jannah? He said, absolutely. You will be able to enter the doors of Jannah. But for every key, has its specific ridges. Right? Just like you want to enter the door of your house. Right? You're going to need to have the proper cut key. If not, you can't get in with your car key. You can't get in with your mailbox key. You're going to need the proper key that is cut correctly. And for us, our shahada, it needs to have the proper ridges in order for us to enter into Jannah. And the scholars, they have derived these conditions from the Qur'an and they have derived them from the Sunnah. So this is something derived from Wahi, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, telling us how to cut this key in order for us to make sure that when we reach the doors of Jannah, we put that key in and we enter with ourselves and our family and our loved ones. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be amongst those who enter into the doors of Jannah. And I want to share these conditions with you. So we understand what we need in order to support our statement of La ilaha illallah. The first of which is knowledge. The first of which is knowledge. And this is something that negates ignorance. Knowledge negates ignorance. And ignorance is a disease. And its only cure is knowledge. Kufr and shirk, all of this is a disease of the heart. And the only way for this to be rectified, and the only way for this to be cleared, is through knowledge. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us in the Qur'an, فَعَلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Know and understand that He is Allah, the only deity that is worthy of worship. Imam Abu Khari rahimahullah, in one of his chapters of his Sahih, he writes in his title, al bab Knowledge before statements and actions. Meaning, we cannot make any statement regarding Islam and we cannot perform any action regarding an Islam except that there's a prerequisite. And that prerequisite is what? Knowledge. 
We have to know who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. We have to understand al-uluhiyya, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That there's nothing before Him, there's nothing after Him, there's nothing that is worthy of worship except for Him. We need to understand the rububiyyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that He is our creator, that He is our maintainer, and that He is our sustainer. And we need to understand the asma and sifa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to understand His names and we need to understand His attributes. Because when we understand these things about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it allows us to become more sincere and it, it encourages us to worship Him because we truly understand who He is subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his prophethood was how many years? Who can tell me? Ahmed. 23 years. He became Prophet at 40 years old. And he passed away sallallahu alayhi wasallam at the age of 63. And throughout those 23 years, how many years did he stay in Mecca? Hmm? 13 years. 13 years he stayed in Mecca. And throughout those 13 years, sallallahu alayhi wa the one thing that he was doing was teaching the people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala truly is. Is it justice for me to sit here for an hour and teach and talk about the reality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is much more deserving of that. And for that reason, we will have a lecture about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when it comes to the articles of faith, the pillars of Iman. Right now we are studying the pillars of Islam. We will later study the pillars of Iman. If I ask you, what's the difference between the pillars of Islam and the, and the pillars of Iman? Who can tell me by putting your hand up? What's the difference? Why don't we just put them all together and say the pillars of Islam are 11? 5 plus 6 is 11. What's the difference? You got it. Very good. You have something to say? Same. Go ahead. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. That is absolutely correct. Both of you are right. That's what it is. Arkan al-Islam, the pillars of Islam, they teach us how to act as Muslims. What to do. How to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where are the, are, uh, the pillars of, of Iman, they teach us what to have from within. Our heart, what we should believe in. So if somebody asks me, what is Islam? Then I would tell him, Islam is the five pillars of Islam. And if they ask me, what do Muslims believe in? Then what would I say to them? I would share with them the pillars of Iman. I would share with them the pillars of Iman. And we will discuss the pillars of Iman at a later time. ta'ala. So the first condition is that we have knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second condition is that we have certainty. We have certainty in our hearts and in our minds that Allah is one. There is no other God. There is no father. There is no son. There are not multiple gods. There are not multiple deities that are worthy of worship. I am certain without a shadow of a doubt that there is Allah and He exists and He sees us and He watches us and He judges us and He loves us and He looks after us. You are certain. Without a shadow of a doubt. Yes, the shaitan will come to you. Yes, the shaitan will come to you and he will ask you, Who created Allah? He will start waswas, whispering to you. But so as long as you don't fall into those traps of the shaitan, and you seek refuge in Allah from the cursed shaitan, then you are fine. Then you are absolutely fine. So you have to have this certainty. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَرْتَابُوا Really the people who truly believe in Allah, the mu'min, is the one who believes in Allah and in His Messenger and is not mutaraddid. And he is not in a state of doubt. Because the opposite of certainty is doubt. And the Muslim is never in doubt when it comes to the reality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Third of which is acceptance, al-qabool. So now you have knowledge. Now you're certain, 
What is upon you is that you accept. That you accept this religion, and that you accept Allah in your life. And that you make it the cornerstone of your life. You live and you die by this statement, La ilaha illallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow our final words to be La ilaha illallah, Muhammad rasulullah The fourth of which is submission. Submitting to Allah. I tell my students this all the time, and I ask Muhammad, what is Islam? What is submission to Allah? There's two components, and I want you to tell me, because I know you know. This is, this is Muhammad. Muhammad in five, ten years, inshallah, this is where he's going to be sitting, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. This is where he will be sitting, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. This is where he'll be standing, inshallah ta'ala. We make dua for our brother Muhammad, inshallah ta'ala. Total and complete submission to the will and the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What's the will of Allah? How do we submit to the will of Allah? Pop tire, car accident, I'm sick, I got fired. That's submitting to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Things happen in life. Sometimes they're great, sometimes they're horrible. But we as Muslims must submit to that will. The Prophet ﷺ says, How great is the situation of the mu'min? That when good comes to him, he is thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is good for him. And when evil or hardship comes upon him, he is patient and accepting. And that is good for him. So the quality of the Muslim is that he is continuously accepting of the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Kataba Maqadir al Khalaiq, Kabla Yakhluk al Samawati, Wal Arbi Khamsina al Fasana, Wa Arshuhu, Al al Ma'a. That Allah wrote down everything that would happen 50,000 years before the creation of the heavens and the earth. Everything that would happen, the good and the bad, it has been written down in a Loh al Mahfuz. And it is for us to accept this because we know that. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests us with a hardship, it is only because He loves us. Huh? It is only because He loves us. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we must submit to the will and the command. What is the command of Allah? These pillars. These pillars are the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We submit to them. We apply them in our lives. And we do them from the moment... We are able to, from the moment we become responsible in the sight of Allah, to the moment we reach our grave. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to do so. Number five, as-sidq, truthfulness. When we take this statement of la ilaha illallah, and we make this statement, as we said, from our hearts and from our tongue, we do this with total and complete honesty. We don't take this statement for any type of worldly benefit. Sometimes you will have people who say, you know what, this person needs to accept Islam in order for me to marry them. So they will come and they will give the shahada. But the shahada is not for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The shahada is for marriage. There's no problem if you want to get married to somebody, let's teach them about Islam. Because if Islam is taught properly, and the person is sincere in looking for the truth, there is no doubt that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide that person to the haqq. There is no doubt that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide that person to the haqq. So when this statement is made, we make sure that we make this statement to please Allah, and that we're honest with this, and that when we go to sleep at night, we ask ourselves, did we uphold this statement today? Did we uphold this statement of La ilaha illallah? Number six is al-ikhlas, sincerity. Is this statement worship? Absolutely. وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ مُخْلِسِينَ لَهُ That Allah did not order us that we worship Him with, uh, except in the state of sincerity. And what is sincerity? Sincerity is to, to, to يعني التخلص من الإخلاص يعني تتخلص من الدنيا كلها. You leave this dunya. 
There is no dunya in your heart. It is okay to hold the dunya in your hand. But the dunya is not in your heart. And this statement of La ilaha illallah is solely for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Last but not least is al mahabbah the love. That this statement, it must, we must have a sense of love. Love of Allah, that we love Allah, that we love the people who love Allah, and that we love the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. We love Allah. Why do we love Allah? Here's a better question. I'm going to ask somebody. Why do you love your dad? Ah, I put him on blast right now. Why do you love your dad? His dad is sitting. His dad is sitting by him. Why do you love your dad? Because he cares for me. Do you love Allah more than your dad or do you love your dad more than Allah? Why? Because he's your creator and he cares more for you. This is what we call fitra. It's fitra. Natural disposition. Inside of every person, they will love the person who cares for them. You'll love them. I love my mother. I love my father. I love my wife. I love my brothers. I love my sister. I love them all. Why? Because they got my back. I love the community. Right? So this is a component. We love Allah because He's better than my father. Right? Don't worry. I love Allah more than my father too. Right? We love Allah. We love our parents. We love our mother. We should love our mother more than anything. But never more than Allah. That is why there is no obedience to the creation when that goes against the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because our love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is greater than any love of this dunya. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instill the quality of love in our hearts for Him and for His religion. طيب. So we've discussed about the first part of al-shahada. We've discussed the first part of the shahada. Now it's time for us to discuss the second part. وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدَ الرَّسُولُ اللَّهِ Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet of Allah. The greatest man to ever step foot on this earth. The most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is our teacher. He is our role model. He is our idol. We want to be with him. We want to be like him in every way. From the way that he looks. From the way that he acts. From the way that he worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We want to be like Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now when we make this statement of Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah, we're submitting, we're submitting to three main things. The first of which is that we are submitting to the fact that Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the final prophet and messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this inclines that there were previous prophets and messengers. From Adam alayhi salam, to Nuh, to Ibrahim, to Musa, to Isa, to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We believe in all of them. And we believe in the message that they came with. Now who can tell me the message that all of these men came with? The common denominator. Yes, the sharia, the legislation that these men came with are different. The legislation at the time of this ummah is different than the time at the ummah of, of Musa, the ummah of Ibrahim, the ummah of Nuh. But what is the common denominator here? Tawheed. It's the first part. Ashhadu Allah. Ilaha illallah. They all came with this exact same message. There is only one God and worship Him. He is not a man. He is not a creation. He is not an idol. He is the creator and you are the creation. Everything that He has created is to serve you. And you have been created to serve Him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was the message. 
That was the message of the prophets and the messengers. So we submit to that fact that he is the final prophet and he is the final messenger. And that he came and they all came with the statement of La ilaha illallah. Number two is that the prophet never spoke out of his own whims or his desires. It's wahi. The prophet was inspired. He was not an angel. The prophet was not an angel. He was flesh and blood. Just like me and you. I'm a man just like you. The only difference is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has inspired me. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent the archangel Jibreel and he has revealed the Quran to me. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he never spoke out of his own wombs. And whenever he did something that was displeasing to Allah, Allah would call him to account immediately. Immediately. And there are many situations when we study the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu that the Prophet would do something and immediately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would call him to account. Even in the Quran, till the day that we die, we will be reciting this. Abasa wa tawalla. We will be reciting this because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordained for him to be a perfect example. To be a perfect example for mankind. Rahmatan lil alameen. Last but not least is that everything the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was instructed to propagate, he propagated it. Meaning he spread the message of Islam totally and completely. Which means that any type of innovation that comes into this deen that is not from the Prophet ﷺ He who does something that is not from this religion, that is not from what the Prophet ﷺ has come with, فَهُوَ رد. Even if it's a, 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 an amazing amount of, of goodness, فَهُوَ رد. Nobody worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala better than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when he tells us to pray two rak'ah, we pray two, we don't zid ala thali. When he tells us to fast the month of Ramadan, we don't fast every single day of our lives. Because we think, because we think, as one of my teachers always used to say, don't think, because the more you think, the more you sink. Right? So we need to know. We need to know, we need to be certain, we need to have this yaqeen. We know what the sunnah is. We know the way the Prophet ﷺ prayed. We know the way he fasted. We know he performed hajj. We know how he gave zakat. We know these things. Because he is our Prophet. Salawatullahi wa salamun alayhi. There is no better time to give peace and blessings upon the Prophet than Friday. Ikhwa, we are Friday. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Salawatullahi wa salamun alayhi. So that's what it is. I don't know how long I've taken for the first. I think that's maybe about 45 minutes. I won't take too much more of your time. But that is a brief introduction to the shahada, to your belief in the shahada. Can I quickly recap, if you would allow me? The shahada is a testimony of faith, something that we say from our hearts and from our tongues. And it's something that must be said in order for us to enter into Islam. And this shahada is broken into two components. The first of which discusses the oneness of Allah. That He is one. He has no father. He has no son. There is nothing co-equal or comparable unto Him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala amma yasifun. He is our Lord. He has beautiful names and beautiful attributes that we make dua and we call upon Him by using them. He is the one who created us. He is the one who sustained for us. And He is the only one that is deserving of our total and complete submission to the will, to His will, and to His command. And we believe in a man, a great man, Muhammad 
صلوات الله والسلام عليه a man that never spoke out of his own whims or his desires a man who cared for you and me more than we care for ourselves a man who when given the biggest responsibility upheld it to the best of his ability salawatullahi wa salamun alayhi a man who is the final messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the final prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa used to say jaddidu aymanukum rejuvenate your iman the camera is like how are we going to rejuvenate our iman qulu la ilaha illallah la ilaha illallah let's move on to the second pillar let's move on to the second pillar which is the pillar of salah the pillar of salah and in the in the hadith itself the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uses specific terminology. He says, Iqam as salah Meaning, establishing Salah. Now, there's a difference between performing Salah, forgive me. <clears throat> now, there's a difference between performing Salah and establishing Salah. When we perform salah, we're only talking about a physical action. Right? Takbir, right? Ruku', sujood, taslim. Right? From afar, we might do it in the park, people think we're performing yoga. But when we establish our prayer, it's almost three dimensional. It's three dimensional. Because there's the physical aspect, which is, you know, the takbir the ruku' and the sujood, the taslim. And then there's the emotional aspect that I am standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then there's the religious aspect that you are reciting the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In every movement, you are praising the greatest Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you're praying, you need to be establishing your salah. Not performing your salah. Some of the salaf, they used to say, we pray as if we see Allah. Not necessarily they see the being of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but as if they know that they recognize, you know, the, the hadith of Ihsan, uh, uh, um, where, where, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Al-Ihsan an ta'abudullah ka'annaka tarah. Fa'in lam ta'kun tarah fa'innahu yaraq. Worship Allah as if you see Him. They say, we worship Allah as if we see Him. And it is as if Jannah is on our right, and Jahannam is on our left, and the angel of death is over our head. This is the amount of concentration and devotion that they have in their salah. Whereas us, when we come into our salah, sometimes when you come in late, you see, Allahu Akbar. Brother, sometimes, you know, we see this sometimes. The brother's kind of wiggly, right? He ate too much, right? It's wiggly. Some brother, we can, we can actually smell what he ate, right? This is not the state we should be coming into salah. We must respect salah. We must respect this. If somebody said you had a meeting with the Prime Minister of Canada, Wallahi, you guys would be wearing your nicest clothes. You would be wearing, you know, your nicest cologne. Right? You'd go and get a fresh cut, you'd look nice and fresh because you were going to meet the, president, the Prime Minister of Canada. What about Allah? We come to Salah at times, we're coming from work, Barakallahu Fikum for coming to the masjid. But the thing is, you know, we're not in the best of, 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 of clothing, we don't smell that good, right? We just finished having, having a huge shawarma up the street. And then we come to Salah. The Prophet would never come to Salah. The Prophet Sallallahu forbade us from coming to Salah. Even I was out for lunch with Sheikh Hassan just a couple of days ago. And it was about 6 o'clock and we were eating and we were eating. And then we realized we ate basal. And then my car was parked here at the masjid. And Sheikh Hassan, or another brother, sorry, he gave me a ride back down to my car. Sheikh Hassan's like, 
you're not going to pray in the masjid, are you? And I'm thinking, I'm like, ah, not that bad. You know what I'm saying? But that's not the point. The point is that the Prophet ﷺ said that it is an annoyance, not only to the people who come to the masjid, but to the angels. But to the angels. Right? So we must respect that setting, that when we come to the masjid, khuluzinatukum, yani take your best of, of clothing, look good. You guys, mashallah, you all look great, mashallah, tabarakallah. Look good, smell good. Right? Come in with the proper attitude that you're going to be standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we look at the word salah, linguistically, it's derived from the word salah, which means relationship, or which means connection. Meaning salah is the greatest means in order to connect and in to develop a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm telling you, there are people, uh, I live, I live in, 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 in Mecca, I live in Medina, sorry, and I visit, I visit Mecca a lot, alhamdulillah. And sometimes you have people, they miss the jama'ah, like all the salawats in the haram, where the, where the reward is a hundred thousand. You know, one prayer is worth a hundred thousand prayers, more, maybe more than you ever perform in your life. One prayer, one prayer alone. And they spend the whole day, and they try going to Ghar al-Hira. And they think that this will bring them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As if they're going to sit in the cave and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to send Angel Jibreel come down and say, Uqtub. <laughs> Uqtub. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Salah is your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your salah is your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The moment you leave your salah, in essence, what are you saying? I'm leaving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The moment you leave your salah or you even delay your salah, you're saying, you know what? I'm putting Allah on the back burner. What I'm doing now is more important. And that is not true. And that is not appropriate. And that is not correct for a person who claims Islam, who claims La ilaha illallah. I just want to get into the ruling. And I know you guys know this, but I just want to share this because there's a lot of people here who have just accepted Islam. There are people here today who have accepted Islam. Now, brother, everyone's looking around. Who's this new Muslim? Right? You don't know. Right? You don't know who it is. But there are people here who have accepted Islam. And we must talk about these things. It's always best going back to the basics. The rulings of Islam. Now, prayer is an obligation. And it's an obligation on every Muslim huh, who is mature who is sane and who is responsible. Don't say, oh, my wife says I'm not responsible, salah is not uh, uh, mandatory for me. No, you're a responsible Muslim. Now, there is exemptions for the women when they're on their menstruation or when they're on their postnatal and there's still blood flowing, then she is exempted from prayer. She is exempted from prayer until the blood ceases and she then purifies herself by doing uh, ghusl, major ablution. And then she prays again. She doesn't need to make up any salah. Yuridullahu bikum al yusr wa la yuridu bikum yusr. Allah wants it easy for you. Right? It's hard enough maintaining five daily prayers. Imagine a woman when she's not praying for a full week, she has to make that week up. This is not from Islam. This is not from Al Islam. The Prophet came as a mercy not as a, uh, an annoyance to this ummah. Salawatullahi wa salamun alayh. When it comes to salah, salah has specific times. Inna salah, inna salah takanat alil mu'minina kitab al mawquta. Meaning, salah has its specific times, and these times were taught to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by Jibreel alayhi salam. These times were taught to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by Jibreel alayhi salam. So for you to say, I can extend my time here, and for you to say, I can put these salah together, we are going against that which Jibreel taught Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And salah, there's no exemption when in terms of times. Meaning if you're traveling, you have to pray. Even if you are in a battle, you need to pray. You must pray. There is no exemption when it comes to the time of prayer. When the time comes in, it is upon us to prostrate, 
to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and submit ourselves. Place. Now, the Prophet was very special. In, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an authentic hadith, the Prophet sallallahu said, I've been given five things that the Prophets before me were never given. And one of which was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the world, made the earth pure and clean for him and for this ummah to pray upon. So we can pray in any place, on the hills, right? On the mountains, on sand, right? Even underwater, I've seen people who are praying. We can pray in these places because it is pure. And they are made, it is made for us. And every place that we put and we make sujood will testify for us on the day of judgment. It will testify for us on the day of judgment. This carpet will testify for us on the day of judgment. That this man came and he sat here and he listened to a lecture and he prayed Maghrib and he prayed Isha and he was constantly coming to the masjid. Subhanallah. And... Prayer is also recommended and mandatory in every hal, meaning in every situation that you find yourself in. If you are sick, you need to pray. If you are tired, you need to pray. There is no exemption. If you can't stand, what did the Prophet say? Sit. If you cannot sit, what did the Prophet say? Then lie down. If you're not able to pray lying down, then pray with your finger. If you're not able to pray with your finger, then pray with your eye. If you're not able to pray with your eye, then pray with your heart. Salah. It will never drop. From the cradle to the grave. That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and yaj'alana min al-musalleen. Now, I want to get into a topic here that might be a little bit touchy but it's important that we address it. The ruling of the individual who decides to leave Salah. The ruling of the individual who have decided to leave Salah. Now I just want to share with you a couple hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam clearly mentioned. Where he said, Allah Al-Ahd, Alladhi Baynana Wa Baynahum As-Salah. Man Tarakaha Faqad Kathar. That the covenant, or what separates us from them, meaning those who disbelieve, is our salah. That's what separates us. That's what makes us unique. That's what brings us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَمَنْ تَرَكَهَا فَقَدْ كَثَرْ The person who leaves it, then that, in, that individual has then disbelieved in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In another hadith, بَيْنَ الرَّجُلُ وَبَيْنَ الشِّرْكِ وَالْكُفْرِ تَرْكَ الصَّلَاةِ that between the man and shirk and kufr, associating partners with Allah and denying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this religion is what? Tark salah Now, the scholars, of course, there are many respected opinions when it comes to the ruling of the individual who leaves his salah. And I'm not going to get into this is right and this is wrong. Rather, I'm going to just mention the opinion of those respected scholars, especially from the Hanbali Madhab, that state that the individual who decides to leave his Salah, knowing that Salah is part of this religion, then that individual has committed an act of Kufr. So much so that Sheikh bin Baz rahimahullah, I believe this was his fatwa, where he said, where he said, rahimahullah, if even the person were to set his alarm clock after the time of Fajr, intending and fully knowing that he is not going to wake up for Salah, then that person has committed a form of kufr, an act of kufr. Whether or not this is the strongest opinion, what this shows us is the importance and the ihtimam that we have to have towards our salah. We have to have this importance. That, uh, Subhanallah, I was, I was preparing for this lecture and I was telling my wife, there's something wrong with me, I feel nervous, I don't know why, I usually I don't feel nervous. 
And it was 7 o'clock and I was so engaged in this lecture and then I looked at myself, I said, oh my God. Asr. So I feel kind of like a hypocrite right now coming and talking to you guys about praying on time when I delayed my salah for just over an hour. Because Allah is more deserving of that. He deserves better than that. When we make dua, He answers that dua immediately. And similarly for us as Muslims and as servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is important that when He makes that call to us, Hayya ala salah, Hayya ala falah, that we answer that call not an hour later, but immediately. For inna Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yastahiqa thalik. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is most deserving of that. I just want to end today's lecture about prayer with a few virtues and blessings to help us encourage ourselves in establishing our prayer. You know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he found great relief and ease when it came to Salah. He would say to Bilal radiallahu an, Arihna biha ya Bilal. Meaning, allow us to remain, uh, oh no, allow us to become comfort, comfortable, allow us to become at ease, Ya Bilal, with the call of the Adhan or the Iqamah. The Prophet, he found e uh, comfort in hearing the call of prayer. Nowadays, when our phones go off, what happens? Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Oh. And then you start postponing it. The Prophet, he found comfort in that. He didn't say, Arih, Arihna minha ya Bilal. He didn't say, oh, uh, let us find comfort in leaving it, O oh Bilal. No, let us find comfort in it. Wasta'inu bi sabri wa salat. Find your comfort in salah. Find your refuge in salah. It is your direct connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no one that needs to come and speak on your behalf when you are praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you recite Quran, Allah is talking to you. When you are in your sujood, you are talking to Allah. And the closest you will ever be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the moment you put your head down, which is the most honorable place on your body. And you lie it down and you put it on the floor. And you say, Subhana Rabbi al-A'la. Glory be to the one, the most high. My Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So prayer, it offers us comfort and ease and relaxation. It offers us a means to cleanse our sins. The hadith that we all know. If there was a river in front of your house and you washed yourself in this river five times a day, would you have any dirt on you? Would you have any dirt on you if your dad says go take a shower five times a day? Absolutely not. Similarly, similarly, our wudu for our salah, our sins are dripping from our fingers, the sins that we've committed using our iPhone. Huh? Using our iPhone, these sins that we commit. Right? The money that we take, the sins are falling from us. The things that we see when we wash our face, the sins are falling. The places we have gone when we wash our feet, our sins are falling. We are becoming clean. We are purifying ourselves. And on the day of judgment, these limbs will be vibrant. These limbs will be light. So much so that when the companions, they heard this, some of the companions, they started making wudu up to their shoulders. I'm going to make wudu up to my shoulders so I can be noor yawm al-qiyamah. So I can be noor. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yazzuqna al-noor fi dunya wal akhirah I get this a lot. Someone will come to me and say, brother, I want to accept Islam. But I have a girlfriend or I have a boyfriend or I want to accept Islam but I'm drinking a lot of alcohol and I'm addicted or I'm smoking or I'm doing drugs sister will come to you I want to accept Islam but I don't want to wear the hijab at this moment what do we say to these individuals? well tough luck there's the door no 
we give them the same advice the Prophet ﷺ would give them, and that is to pray. Accept God in your life, accept Allah in your life, and pray. إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ تَنْهَا عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ طيب, if you are praying correctly, and you are establishing your prayer, that in due time, you will leave this alcohol. You will leave this bad habit. You will leave smoking. You will want to cover yourself and protect yourself. You will want to do this without anyone forcing you except for your own desire. So pray. If you have a sin that you have been committing for so long, then check your prayer. Because if your prayer is correct, then you will be correct. But if your f prayer is deficient, then you as a Muslim, you will have some deficiency. So we need to go back to our salah. فَإِنَّ الصَّلَاةِ تَنْهَا عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ الصَّلَاةِ تَنْهَا عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us away from all the evil and indecent actions. Last but not least, the first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask you about on the Day of Judgment is your prayer. Nothing more. He will ask you about your prayer. He won't abbas ask you about anything else. Imagine meeting and standing in front of Allah for the first time after learning and knowing so much about Islam and coming to this lecture today and standing in front of Allah and Him asking you, Ya Fulan, Ya Muhammad, Ya Ahmed, Ya Ibrahim, Ya Ali, I just want your prayer. And you stand and you say to yourself, Ya Allah, Dunya, Ya Laytani, Qaddamtu li hayati. I wish. Send me back so I could pray. There is no second chance. This is high time that we accept this prayer and this connection into our lives and that we treat it better than we've treated anything because it is the most valuable thing that we possess, our prayer because it is our direct link to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to testify to the fact that there is no deity that is worthy of worship except for Him and that Muhammad the son of Abdullah is His servant and His final messenger and I ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to be amongst those who pray with an open heart, on time, with sincerity and devotion and concentration. I ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to listen to this speech and follow the best of it. Subhanakallahum bihamdika, ashadu an la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.